Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm Albert Partantex with Noam Broussard. We're going to talk today about what's changing in outlier detection. Noam, what is changing in outlier detection? It's been around for a very long time. Yeah, well, I think that uh, the main thing that's changing is that the normal way of approaching outlier detection, which is based on broad statistics, is not sufficient to meet the demands today, which is you want to keep those yields high, but you, you want to have very high quality, and therefore you cannot just base your outlier detection on just broad, you know, good die, bad neighborhood, or um, uh, part average testing. And part of the, what's going on here is that we're getting more chips, chiplets into a design. These things are getting much more complicated. You've got many more processing elements, more memories. So now when you interact with things, it's no longer just, is this one die going to function within spec? It's now, will this die function within spec, but with all the individual pieces there too, right? Because some of these effects are additive. Exactly. And, and if you're looking at a whole system of these chiplets, for instance, you have to make sure not only it's high quality with respect to pass fail, nowadays you want to make sure it's not even marginally uh, failing. So some, some tests, some chips may pass a test, but later on, since they're so marginal, very soon in the field they will fail. Therefore, we have to do a much better job in that outlier detection. Let's take a closer look. Okay. Noam, what are we looking at? So let's take a, a generalized look at how we do outlier detection based on statistical methods. What you can see here are as a, as a population distribution of a certain measurement on the full population of, uh, of, uh, of, of chips. So in this case, for instance, we took IDQ measurements. You can see that most of them are in the middle, but some of them are spread out uh, in the distribution. The idea behind outlier detection at a very high level nowadays is to find limits at which beyond them you would flag them as outliers and within that population they would be okay. The problem with that is that if you want higher yield, you don't want to throw out chips that are unnecessary that might be good, you'll extend those limits beyond these points that I have over here, but now you risk having lower quality and vice versa. If you want to have the highest quality possible, you'll bring in those limits but now, when you bring on those limits, you have many more chips that will fail, hence, uh, hence uh, 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 ruining your yield. And your tolerances change depending upon what you're actually putting together too, right? So you think about the old days when you had a chip. It was either good or it was bad, and there really was very little in between. Nowadays, it's okay to have some of these chips that are m more important, maybe mission critical or, or safety critical, those are going to be at a much higher tolerance level than the, the other ones, right? Right. The, the newer emerging applications, such as the automotive, uh, there is no, uh, you cannot risk failure in the field. So we're going to be really tightly bound on those things. But like you said, we have tolerances. And even if something passes, we want to be able to see how marginal that, that component is. So is it passing just on the thread of a hair or is it uh, does it have a lot of margin and it will uh, which predicts a very long lifetime so we want to have that visibility and what you're really looking for here is not just individual chips you're looking at the whole system too right completely completely we, we this same thing the same uh, approach that i want to present to you will be applicable also to uh the chips the system of chips so uh uh, 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 uh system in a package and also to the system itself that comprises those chips so how do we get there? What's the next step here? So our approach is to look at the expected measurement or expected result for each chip individually, as opposed to looking at a broader scope of the full population. So in this case, we took any chip that off the pile that I, that I look at, we'll compare it to the full population of the chips. But that might mean that here in this range over here, we have a chip that is okay in the range, but it itself does not uh, meet its, ex its expected measurements, and hence it should have been flagged as an outlier. And vice versa, chips that are out here, they're outside of the general population, but they might be actually good chips that we're throwing out for nothing. So our approach will be now to look at each chip individually and decide if it is uh, measuring, the, the uh, in this case IDQ is measuring as expected. Why wasn't this done in the past? Well, the the the, the technology behind that would require that we look at the chip from inside and have a very high resolution visibility at different physical parameters 
that will feed into our ability to characterize per chip what its expected measurement is. Do you have more parameters now than you had in the past as well because you can see inside the chip? Well, we look at things like uh, process-oriented measurements, but we have very high-resolution monitors in the chip which can negate noise factors to look exactly at the process itself. We also do more novel things like looking at path delays and looking at the path delay that we're measuring, mostly in latter stages of testing and system testing as well, ATBG for instance, and we're comparing it to what we expected uh, at pre-silicon according to simulation. So that's a novel way of looking at it, the timing margin of millions of paths or the delay of millions of paths compared to the simulations. So what does the data actually show you here? So let's go to the next picture over here. Um, what I drew here is just a super or a tilting of the data that I had up here. You can see on the x-axis the expected measurement, which is that novel parameter that we're bringing for our, outlier, our smart outlier detection, and the actual measured parameter. In this case, let's stick with IDQ. If you look at these dotted lines over here, you can see that the whole population is measuring within the expected measured limits which in the case that I just showed you would indicate that all the chips here are okay. From our point of view, using these more advanced monitors, these process monitors, the design uh, profiling monitors, these margin measurement monitors, combining all that information, we're able to model using our machine le learning uh, algorithms what would be the expected measurement, in this case of IDQ, as compared to the actual uh, measured. And now what we see here is that in this population, there are two chips which are inside the normal range, but from our point of view, they are very far from that regression line of expected versus measured. So you'll see that these two are remote. Maybe I should have drawn them a little bit far, further out. That distance means it's too far off what we expected for that particular chip. So we can identify them. We've shown this over and over as indeed being outliers. We've run tests aside on these chips that shows that indeed we're finding these and we've had quite a lot of success in increasing the, the, uh, the DPPAs found without uh, hitting the yield. In the past when they dealt with this, it was pretty much add more margin in, put an extra circuitry so that you know exactly if this doesn't work, then we can fail over into the, the next uh, processor core or whatever it happened to be. No. What you're doing here, though, is, is really trying to knock down the margin, right? Right. We're try well, in this, in this particular case, we're trying uh, to flag those chips that are uh, outliers before you get to that point where you have to uh, compensate by redundancy or adding more margins or garbage. We do have another, so like I mentioned in the beginning, we have different monitors looking at different physical aspects of the chip. We do have a different approach because we believe in lay, overlaying the different capabilities, the different views of what the chip is supposed to, uh, the expected measurement versus measured. I did, measure the, I did mention that we look at many, many paths in the chip and look for their margin to timing failure as compared to their simulation in the past. And that's exactly where we'll see not only if it doesn't meet the expected timing margin in the past, but even if it does, how marginal really is it? And that's a, that's a novel way of looking at a chip now. Not just is it pass or fail, but is it passing but very marginal and it might fail very soon and very early in its lifetime. You've also flipped the yield equation on its head here because what you've said is that you can approach yield from the standpoint of, oh, we get so many chips and in, in, when it finally gets through final tests, we know that they're bad or they're good or they're not quite good enough. Whereas now what you're saying is, we're not even going to run it through that whole thing. We're just going to identify it straight on going, it just came off the line. This is this is not worth uh, pursuing. It's probably going to fall out of the bucket of what's acceptable. So now let's go back and fix the process. So yeah, you have many, with this kind of visibility, the options are uh, for the uh, vendor himself what to do. They could use lower margin chips for lower uh, binning. So they can use it for less uh, critical uh, applications. They can indeed say, uh, we're not taking any chances. It's a high uh, reliability kind of a product. This will be binned uh, off, it'll be uh, thrown out. So really the, the option is up to the, but, but the point is that you need this kind of visibility to even make that kind of a decision. Otherwise you're blind, it's pass fail, and you're more or less, uh, you know, uh, statistics are, are very broad. A lot of this came out of the automotive chips where they were worried about, are these chips going to function out in the real world? 
Is it now moving into other markets? Is it just the mission critical, safety critical, or is it showing up in other, other areas as well? No, definitely it's uh, like we see in many other requirements that start off from automotive, which is very mission critical, but they're going also into, for instance, uh, hyperscaler data centers. It's not mission critical, but the cost of failure of one machine out of uh, many, many thousands is just unacceptable. So they're looking for very, very high yield, but very, very high quality as well. We know, and we've discussed in other um, contexts, uh, the rise of the SDC, or at least the importance that is associated, that is driven mostly from the data center verticals. They're fearing the SDC, and that's just another example of the kind of failure that would be hard to detect without this kind of visibility. So, yeah, to, to, your, to your question, we're, we're seeing it in all verticals that we're dealing with. Noam Broussard, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.